A31 actually proved something extremely important. There was a very good chance that the North Sea would have an active petroleum system. That was really good news. The second well on the Norwegian continental shelf spotted also in 1966, but was not completed until 67 because of a mishap with the drilling rig. 25111 was also an extremely important well because it didn't only prove a petroleum system, an active petroleum system, it actually proved live oil. It was not that much, but later on, uh, after the geologist understanding some of the geology, not all of it, it turned out to be an oil field. This is the Balder oil field. It was put on production in 1999, 1999 and it's still producing. Uh, ExxonMobil is not the operator anymore, but it's still producing. It's a very complicated reservoir. It's a challenge for the geologist, definitely. Now, 1969. There you are. We have a Reservoir engineer. Our reservoir engineer. Reservoir geologist. Our reservoir engineer. <laughs> 25th of October, 1969. What did you do that particular day? Well, I was nine years old. <laughs> Most likely at school, if not playing soccer. Yeah. So, nine years old. Nine years old. Yes. Uh, didn't, you didn't have a diary. Sorry. You didn't have a diary to note, uh, make notes no, of what no, you're actually no, I don't. doing. I'm no. sorry. Uh, but uh, you have uh, you developed into a, a petroleum geoscientist. You have, and as I understand it, Eduard Hermansen, Philip Petroleum. You have worked with this company your entire career, right? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, <laughs> again, I'm a, I'm a Russian engineer by background and uh, got out of school and kind of faced working times like this. No jobs to get as a restaurant engineer. Uh, but then in the summertime, I was kind of patient, was looking for jobs. And then there was a geophysical company up in here in Steiner that was applying for a restaurant engineer. That geophysical company was GECO, headed up here by Anders Farsveit. I ended up working in a research department, working on 4D interpretation stations for seismics. And this was 1984. As you said, it was in the very beginning of Charisma. I spent three years there coding on Charisma in the first releases. And one of the interesting projects I was working on was automatic horizon tracking, like you also mentioned here. But then this time came when Jiko said, OK, Strom Shea started to talk to him. I said, OK, do I really want to stay, or do I really want to become a real resident engineer? And I joined ConocoPhillips in 1987 to start to implement a kind of a famous water flood. And um, I spent more than 30 years preparing for this presentation, I, I think I can say. I've uh, been working on, on this asset on and off for many, many years. I uh, have also done a lot of other stuff, of course, but Ecofisk is very, very close to heart since it was the first reservoir I was really working on. So preparing for this presentation and knowing that there was going to be some quite some seasoned people in front of me, I kind of expected a lot of my bullets and a lot of my good points to be taken before I got on the stage. So I was a little bit prepared for that when it came to the historical part of it all. So I just prepared this one, and we all talked about it. Phillips came to Oslo in 1962 with a letter to Trick Billy and asking for concession on the Norwegian continental shelf, like Arthur Muller had in Denmark. And okay, I guess some of this work, the ones that were triggering the, the lawyers and the industrial department and so on to kind of getting into looking at the petroleum law and how we were going to attack this and coming up with the legal framework for the licensing system that we, we have here today. Now, we spent quite a lot of time already talking about the long seismic lines, the pencils and, and all of that. That was, in fact, my point is saying that from Lykkeland that we saw a little bit earlier, a lot of that interpretation looked like it was happening here in, in Stavanger. But in fact, this is a gym over in the office building, St. Barsville, 
where they basically were looking at, is there interesting structures on the Norwegian continental shelf that we should go after and drill? And after they had gathered some seismic data, at least. So that was just kind of a curiosity here to, to start with. As I was starting preparing for this presentation too, I found a letter back in 1983 as a response to that 1962 letter, formally rejecting Conoco or Phillips kindly offered to take over the Norwegian continental shelf. So, what did Conoco Phillips, of, of, I'm sorry, I'm going into the habit here of saying Conoco Phillips. Obviously, Conoco and Phillips merged, but this is Phillips' his history in the, in the early days, so bear with me if I'm using those names interchangeably. Now, what the Phillips group at the time that consisted of FINA and Argyp, what they applied for was, or what they got, what they got was the red blocks that are shown here. I think uh, what was kind of interesting here was that the first priority block the Conoco Phillips group applied for was down here, which is a block 27. This block here, which is a 24, was in the 10th priority on when they applied for it. And we know what happened here later on. Now, the Phillips group got re received three production licenses with a number of different blocks, and I'm not going to mention those, but those are the red ones. Uh, there was also a kind of a, a, a farm out of uh, ownership at the time with the, what was called the Petronord Group, where Noskudo was, and the French companies. Now, what the French companies here did, they were trading into the um, licenses that the Phillips Group had, and the Phillips Group got access to some licenses that the Petronor Group had. Um, knowing the history, as we, oh, sorry, knowing the history here of exploration at the discovery down here in 24 later on, I've seen some comments from the French people saying that we traded into some, something that looked like gold, and we traded away something that was not gold. Are we good or are we just lucky? I'm not sure. Now, the commitment that we were going to do was to do seismic acquisition in the areas. And as we said here, Phillips, the Phillips Group had a commitment to drill five 4,000 meter long wells, at least one in each license. That was the commitment, and within a given time frame. And as you saw in Lukulan or the discussion here early on, that Phillips were trying to negotiate away the, the last well. Well, we had quite a long time to drill the last one. So the, a lot of the question were, when was the last well going to be drilled? Now, based on some of the intel that the, the, the geoscientists had done, they already knew that there were some oil finds down in Denmark. And I'm going into looking at the well IFEs, it comes up that there has been potential down in the, in the Danish uh, sector, in the chalk. They knew a little bit about what was happening up in the, in the Paleocene sands, especially on the UK side. So they had that as a, as a target. And they were also looking at like the rot ligands, uh, the, the sex dyes, and the Groningen discovery down in, um, in, um, in the Netherlands. And at the same time, there were some discoveries being made, very deep gas discoveries in the UK side. So those three horizons were the main targets for whatever exploration activities they were going to do. But they started to prioritize drilling up in, in this end of, the, of the, uh, the, the, the licenses received. So the first well the Phillips Group drilled was up here in 1611-1, dry. Well number two, 711-1. And here's the 711 has to be good luck, and it was. And basically, that was the cut discovery. And what we saw here was a, about a 25% porosity sand in the Paleocene interval. Relatively high water saturation, but tested with really good rates. And here comes some sort of a, an early volume estimates of could this be big? The problem was, of course, that it was gas. How could you evacuate the gas without infrastructure? Now, what happened then was that started to do the, the, I'm sorry, the appraisal of that um, structure and drilled one, two, three wells in almost like in, in sequence and with rather disappointing results. Now, the first one, the second one looked pretty good. The third one was more or less wet. And then the structure was shrinking. Later on, drilled the 7.11.4. Again, pretty dry. The volume was coming down. It was gas and it was gas condensate did not have economics to, to develop on its own. 
So exploration was kind of continuing. Uh, drilled two more wells, up per 781, 8101, or 8101, both dry. And now we're getting into the Lukuland story when say, okay, 30 wells have been drilled on the Norwegian continental shelf. Should we drill another one? And then basically what was looked at was a relatively flat structure down in the block 241 or in black in 24 that had some sort of lost the horizons at the very top of the, of the structure. And what you can see there basically, sometimes it, people think that this is a, some sort of a, um, should I use the, the word of a muffin theory? I mean, you have an expansion, you have a, you have a growth and you have a collapse structure at the very top of the, the reservoir. So that data is lost, and it's kind of a block of rock that had been dropped down. So basically what they were looking at was a donut. Drilling on the, oh, sorry, drilling on the, so drilling on the edges of the, what we're calling the kind of gas invaded overburden stuff, drilled down and came down to about 5,500 feet, and then got a significant kick. Now, the optimistic thing there was, of course, that there was oil and gas coming out of the hole. But they lost control of the well. So they sat there circulating, got control of the well, then lost control, mud losses, and gained control, and they were fighting this well for several, several days. But there was a guy that was doing some uh, sampling of that fluid, and so, yeah, yeah, there is oil here, and did some, what should I say, very simple sample techniques by putting oil in buckets and bottles. And so, okay, at least we found something in this area. Now, the well didn't come down to its objective. But the last, at least that there was oil there, was kind of interesting enough to kind of continue. And here's where the really fight was. 1969 was a really bad year for, for Phillips. The, the finances were bad and the board did not really want to drill another exploration well in this year. They tried to put it out, and the question came and say, maybe we should not drill this. Well, the oil sample taken from the overburden zone kind of convinced them that there is oil in the system, there has to be oil somewhere, and the approval to kind of go ahead and drill. The next well was given. So they moved the location about a kilometer south, and was drilling what was, is now called the was now called the 242 well. And you will see some maps there. And I'm intentionally using some older illustrations here for kind of giving the flavor of what they were looking at. But that well, the 242, was in fact called the 241AX for a long time. And that name will pop up. And that means the other wells had different numbers and so on. So there's a lot of confusion about the well names after NPD came and said, you guys need to rename them. So the approval was given to drill the next well. And October 25, we drilled into something that gave us a significant gas kick. Went all over the chart and pulled up and started to core the well. And basically the cores and the cuttings could tell, well, you're now into the, the torque section. And before getting there, there was also testing the intervals up in this level. They cored it, I was trying to test it, and obviously there was no hydrocarbons in that zone, in the, this well. Disappointment, but we really wanted to continue to the bottom. Continue to the bottom, started to get the gas, gas kick, and started to take course from down on. What you see here is the, kind of the discovery well. And I'm going to see quite a few of these as I'm going, going forward. This is a porosity from zero to 50%, and we got what's yellow here is oil, and what's blue is water. But basically what you see here is a tremendously thick reservoir, about 800 feet in this location. Porosity is up to 40% and two different reservoirs. Now, it didn't take a lot of imagination to kind of start to do some volume calculations here and say we got a multi-billion barrel field. So from then on, it was more like, well, now it's just how big is it? So following the discovery, on the 25th, drilling through the reservoir, and the well was abandoned on the Christmas Eve of December, uh, December 24th in 1969. And that's where you see a lot of confusion about the Christmas gift and so on. But you really penetrated the reservoir in October. And what kind of interesting is that Aftenposten 
three days after, got the news that there was something going on. So when we're drilling wells uh, or exploration wells these days, we make sure that the drillers don't talk to unsure people and tell what they see. Because here's, where's the leak? They're coming through the drilling people that go onshore. Now, what did, you, what did you see? Started to drill delineation or appraisal wells. Discovery well, late 69, 243 on the other side was even better. So now we start, started to see even better porosities and we saw the contact, something that looked like the contact for the first time. So very simple volumetric calculations at that time said we had like four and a half to six billion barrels in place depending upon where these two reservoirs in communication or not. Did they have a common contact? So what do you need to do? Do you need, what, how much more information do you really need? Do you really need to start looking at your development plan? But this was a massive discovery to start with from the very get-go. So significant testing happened in the second well because this first one, and not a lot of DSTs were taken. The big concern was obviously we have a low permeability chalk it is, it is fractured, and does it really have productive capabilities or commercial rates? A large number of these tees were made in this guy over here, and he easily tested to four, five, six thousand barrels a day at a very limited drawdown, saying that the entire section set could easily produce 10 to 15,000 barrels a day. Again, I'm using the US units here. Divide by six, you're fine. If I'm going to use cubes here, I'm going to lose track of numbers, so bear with me there. But highly productive wells, and from the fluid analysis and so on, it was easy to see that the recovery factor here, it was a really volatile oil, and the recovery factor was going to be relatively low as long as you produced just above the bubble point. So 8 to 9% above the bubble point, and the rest we needed to expect to see a large gas production. So you need to start to prepare for having a high GOR production if you manage to, to really develop this field. But that's the reason for the low recovery factor estimates here, is that it's a really volatile oil and really expands. So they kind of got a, a good gas solution, uh, gas drive, but the recovery factor here might be relatively low too, to start with. Now, but still, if I'm having four and a half to six billion barrels in place and having a 15% recovery factor, you know you've got a development on your hand. So already at this point, the kind of the full field development planning started but the largest uncertainty were, did this restaurant ma manage to maintain its, productive or its productivity over time? And it's kind of interesting to go back and see what could be risking, uh, what could risk these, uh, this production. What the restaurant engineers did back in the early 1970s um, then was, okay, what might be the major risk here is that the permeability in the fracture system might collapse, the pore structure might collapse, and we might lose productivity pretty fast. So to kind of decide on the, the size of it, this development, they started to say, we need to do test production on this field first. So these four uh, uh, exploration wells, up to 245, the, up here, there, 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 all of these were made into subsea producers in less than 12 to 18 months being ready for test production. And I will come back to that a little bit later. But what also happened in the meantime was that some sort of a, it kind of renewed the interest. As the company started to get cool on exploration, the discovery of aquifers started to kind of boost the interest again. We started to have some more exploration activities in the area. So now we're getting into the later quarters there of 1970, 251. You see the 271 was the first delphi well. Sure, it kind of discovered some signs of oil. That the full size of Elphisk was not kind of decided for before it 243 was made, but at least a discovery well. The West Echo Fisk discovery was, was, was made in the same quarter. Uh, Amaco did a tour discovery over here. Well, we saw that that structure might straddle into our license, so we hurried up because we knew there was a unit, unitization here coming along. So then 27 or, or, or 247 and 8 was drilled. Then we made the other discovery over here. And then Shell made the Albus Shell discovery over there. You see, they also drill right at the border. So we needed to hurry up and drill this one here because we see there was another unitization coming up. So in that quarter, there was made three discoveries alone. Fantastic. I must have been a thrill to be there. 
every place you were putting a well, you had a discovery. And then later on, 1971 and 1972s, the rest were made. And I was just trying to make this in terms of volumetrics, what was discovered here in these relatively short period of time. And you see here the numbers here is about 10 billion barrels of oil and about 3.5 billion barrels of oil equivalents of, of gas. It's a significant province for, for oil, and the majority of that is in chalk, except for the cod discovery that was in the Paleocene sands. So a massive volume and a, a massive area. Now, back to the test production. I talked about the concerns, the risk for compaction, the risk of deteriorating uh, productivity. So these four wells were made into uh, producing wells. Drilling, a drilling rig was made, converted to a producing facility, gas were flared, and the oil was offloaded by on offshore boys. These wells produced easily 10 to 15,000 barrels a day when the oil started to flow. And what you said here earlier on, Vati came out to open it. The oil didn't start to flow before a week after, after some problems. But 40,000 barrels a day constantly went through the system pretty fast after that. And Bratti must have been happy with that, I guess, Mr. Bagger. OK. The interesting thing was when I did the test production, that had already started on the field development. Now, today we're talking about fellow ones or decision get one and two and three. We're talking about integrated reviews. We're talking about partner reviews and we're talking about all of that. And we're ending into a long period of decision making and risk reduction measures and God knows what. It takes years to kind of get through project developments and project approvals these days. Now, the test production and the investments made to do that was happened in less than eight months. The development of the concept of how to develop ECOFISC was made already in 1971 and 1972 and how it was going to look like. Now, the only thing here was how big, how many wells, and so on. But they landed out on a very basic uh, layout with a producing platform to the south, a 2 for Charlie platform to the center, and a producing platform to the north. And the reason for spreading them out was, of course, of drilling technology. You couldn't reach the corners of the field. So that was the main reason for that. The plan was to kind of have, a, have the production being uh, piped up, uh, being offloaded, but the test period told you that the regularity was bad, so you needed to find another solution for that on the long term. Now, the gas could not be evacuated, so basically we had production wells from here, maybe just four there, and, and 15 to 20 up there, but the, all the gas needed to be re-injected to start with. Now, the tank came in later on as a, should I say, a regularity smoother. To be offloading the crude, you needed to have the tank and a million barrels of storage that you could produce into to avoid to shut down the field production over time. So that came in a little bit later. But as the other discoveries were made in the area, it was also built a significant processing facility on top of it to take care of all the other production from the outlying fields that was coming in. So here we also had not just a large and massive development going on with more than 20 platforms being constructed, but it changed all the time during the construction phase. So the processing facility at the top, that came in, in the, as a decision pretty late. And to be able to do that today would have been, should I say, quite different to make those type of changes in the, in the construction phase. Now, the tank started the concrete area. That was the first concrete structure being uh, constructed. And now you can see, yes, we can do it. And I just have that as an illustration here to say what's coming up in the next few days is to say, OK, we have quite a few concrete platforms being constructed. And the tank on Ecofisk was the, the first one. Now, we talked about the 10 golden rules of oil here earlier on. Uh, production from Ecofisk, where should it land? That was the big question. And uh, I think there was a lot of discussions going on, and I know I'm going to step into deep war if I'm getting into all the politics here. But here comes the, the, one of the golden rules that the production should, if at all possible, get into the Norwegian, uh, could come into Norway. Now, the amount of gas that was going to be produced from Ecofisk was maybe larger than the Norwegian market could take. So they started to look at the British and the market at the continent. 
the oil was less, uh, so it was not as obvious where that could and should go. Alternatives were there, of course, and also an alternative into, was it Farsun or something in that area? Egersun was also one of the alternatives. And I could see an article back from those days that the people in Egersun did not necessarily want to have their pipeline coming into that area. I think they might feel so, a little bit sorry for that right now. I understand there was a lot of discussions with the authorities on where to land these. There was a company being uh, uh, put together and like Norpipe with their ownership in the pipeline and the, the processing facilities on shore in Enten and, and Teesside. And I think the last point of discussion here was Stadol when they were, uh, when they were uh, formed, that Stadol should own a 50% ownership in the pipeline to secure Norwegian ownership in the system. And they should only pay like 5% of the investment. So I think the Norwegian company make a relatively good deal of, of that processing and that transport system. But obviously also there was a technical problem here with crossing the Norwegian trench with 34 and or 36 inch pipelines. So the technical solution at the end ended up to have the, the oil production to Teesside and the gas production down to Emden. And one of the compromises were that the NGLs coming out of the processing here in Teesside were shipped back to Bumble for fertilizer production, I guess. So that was part of the discussion that went on with the, with the politicians. Now, talking about Ecofisk and its history, it's difficult to not talk about the, uh, some of the significant safety incidents that happened there. And I will, since I'm a subsurface person, I will just touch upon these. But one way, of course, the, the 2 for Bravo blowout that happened in 1977 due to a safety valve failure under a, a, a workover operation. Obviously, that was first-hand news for a long period of time until the, the blowout was stopped about a week later. Uh, I think also maybe one of the other consequences is that the, the oil industry got awakened on the, the safety risks and what can happen if you do not pay attention to well safety and your operations. And we might also talk about licensing rounds coming on here later on, but the, the HMS and the incidents here had some sort of a consequence of the how fast you moved north of the 62nd degree on, on, your, on your licensing. Secondly, what I would just want to touch upon was the uh, Alexander Kjelland disaster where the uh, living quarter capsized on the Easter of 1980, when it was anchored up next to the Edda platform, where 123 of our colleagues lost their lives. And again, emphasized the danger and the importance of the HMS work that this industry is, is all about. Now, subsidence was an initial concern. Russia Compaction was, was a concern. The seabed subsidence was a concern, but it was the thinking that 3,500 meters or 9,000, almost 10,000 feet of shale would absorb whatever deformation would happen down in the reservoir. But we started to ask, also Amaku and Valhall did, started to see well failures in the early 80s. So we knew reservoir compaction was going on. Whether we would go to the surface, would be another question. There was a young engineer that started already in the 1981 and 82 and started to look at what if compaction in the reservoir transfers to the surface. And he did some simple calculations, looked at the strain and said, okay, maybe 20 to 25 feet at the worst if everything that happens in the reservoir comes to the top. So there was a little bit of discussion internally whether that could happen or not. But it didn't really get into the limelight before one of the offshore persons really started to count the holes on the tank. So if you start to count those, you see I've lost a few. And each of these is about two meters. So at that point, started to calculate and that there was about two to two and a half meters observed compaction at the time. That was bad news. So what do we need to do? And then it's like, okay, the reservoir needs to be pressurized. What needs to happen here? And what can we do to mitigate it? Just as a curiosity, there's another picture here in 2006. We have hardly any of this. Now we have the water up to, to this end. So the sea bottom is subsiding. Consequence of that may be one of the bigger engineering achievements on the Norwegian continental shelf. Six platforms in the middle of the complex were jacked up six to seven meters. 
and we installed a protective wall around the tank and all the processing equipment. Now we call that memorial wall. Now, later on, Equifisk have a long production life. Coming into the mid-90s, we got into the old man syndrome of having leaks in the processing facility. Seabed subsidence kind of said, okay, we had a very important, we have a very important, uh, a very good water flood going. We see an increased production and the Equifisk field have a long life. What do we need to do? Yeah, we need to look at the, the longevity. How do, can we produce this field for the long, for the long run? The decision, oh, sorry. the decision there was then to abandon some of the, the old processing equipment here up at the tank. Some of these other outlying fields were coming to their end of their producing life. They had a, they had a um, relatively good rate, but they could not support the investment to couple themselves back into the complex. New processing facilities were constructed. A new well platform of 50 slots installed to replace these older processing or uh, old uh, platforms that did not have a drilling rig anymore, so we could continue to, to drill. And later on, successful here, who say, okay, the, the field could even take more new platforms, new platforms, adding about 70 more slots there, and a new accommodation con uh, facilities because of the old one starts to become, the two of our hotels starts to become old. And we also wanted to have a long discussion with the single beds and the dual bedding and all of that stuff. So that was a, a large investment to be made to kind of improve the conditions out there on the field. So basically, this is how it looks like today. Elfisk is producing, Equifisk is producing, Embla is producing. The outlying fields are now currently shut in. Now, so what have we produced? So far, this area has produced about 6 billion barrels with BOEs. It peaked about 700,000, significant production. But you see this very sharp drop, and here comes the water injection in. And we get back to that a little bit later on. Now, you can also see we have drilled like more than 1,000 wells into this area. So it's, it's kind of been a pretty active infill drilling area, that's to say it mildly. Value, 2,500 oh, billion knock of value have been generated. We have the majority of that gone. Taxes and fees, goods and services, and a little bit to us. But a significant value and a significant contributor to the Norwegian economy. That you, these numbers tells you, tells you that. Now, so a little bit into Equifisk. It's chalk, it's white. This is reservoir characterization. This is my geology knowledge. It's fractured and it's highly porous, it's soft and it's tight. What more do you need to know? Now, it looks like this. It's a fantastic rock. We normally go to field trips down here. There's champagne houses in the closed door. The geologists have a tendency to find the good places. Um, if, you have, if you like a good Chablis, it's the same rock where that is being grown on. So, Equifisk and Chablis. If you are going to forget everything I'm saying here today, you're going to remember that connection. It's a beautiful rock to look, like, to look at. Shell remains, high porosity, and that's what maintains porosity, but that's also what makes it weak. It's fractured. And what we can also see here is highly fractured, but it's also layer-bound fracture systems. So basically what you can prepare yourself for here, during the depletion phase, we didn't see anything of this. It was just effective permeability and the, the field produced. When you start to put water in the ground, you start to see all of these things. And here is the challenge we have these days, is to know the anisotropies, the local, the vertical, and the aerial heterogeneity in this field is what makes us occupied and employed. Now, so this is just a cartoon to say how it looks like, just to kind of give the size. And if we were putting this on top of Stavanger, we would be, out here would be Bue, down here would be the Condip area, down in Jotterborgen. 300 meters is the height of Dalsnuten. And you start to see the two reservoir sections that we produce from, and the large number of wells that we have drilled from. What I will touch upon a little bit later is a water injection facility sitting up here way up north. And you might ask yourself the question, why did we start so late with injecting water? And why does the platform sit up? North. Why should we do that? I will touch upon that a little bit later. Now, production profile here on Equifisk. 
And this is the aquifer field alone. I peaked up here at about 350,000 barrels a day. And we start to see a constant GOR, but then went through the bubble point and the gas started to come out of solution. The field is depleting fast, and then you need to start to say, okay, there is no strong dry force in this reservoir unless the natural force is here with, that's in the oil and the, the, what comes out of the, the oil. So we say, okay, what can we do? So we start to look at gas injection scenarios back here in 77, war injection studies, lab studies started here back, way back in the 1970s. And here, here we go with a very important and very critical point in Equifisk history. Now, what's important here with water flood? We know that it's chalk. And we had companies that had more their experience from the Middle East in the past. In Middle East, fractured limestones or so, water injections were never going to be injected. It was always gas that was going to be injected. So the companies had very limited experience on doing it. The main risk here was, will the water just break through? And here was the thinking that we are in a fracture system. We might be what we call oil wet, which means the rock didn't like to get water to it. And the water was just traveling down the fracture system, hit the producers, and we will just be circling water through and waste a gem oil field. That was the big risk. Now, there was also a question being raised, what happens when I'm putting water on chalk and this is what you normally see. It's getting pretty wet and weak. Sorry. And then obviously, could we have sustained inductivity in a, in a rather tight reservoir? So it ended up with being a lot of lab studies to see what the efficiency was. And also, we needed to test it. This was not a, this was not a given that this was going to happen. Basically, what we saw was that there was only one of the formations that will had wanted to see the war. The rest of the formation, basically two thirds of the oil in place, did not like to see more war in the lab studies. So the war injection was focusing on the tor, and the tor formation was just to the north. And then we had, well, we had a successful pilot test. The injection platform was placed to the north because the targets were only the lower formation or the lower reservoir and to the north of the structure. Now, that might not, in the hindsight, might be the exact science. That's, that's, that's what we can say now. So, to sanction a full field project was a challenge to do this because of the high risk. Oil prices were coming down. Two to three percent incremental oil recovery from the field due to this water flood, not a lot, and with very high risk, and risk the Equifisk field up against two to three more percent of recovery was a challenge. The economics were not very well or very good. And here's where at least a very good example where the NPD and the, the, uh, the companies were working together to find a solution to get this implemented. And the solution to this was to get some financial relief, get some depreciation or tax breaks on this as a, as a start help and get it implemented. So that is a, one of the good examples that we, the NPD saw the value of this. The corporate, the, 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 the company saw that this could be good, but at a very high risk. Got sanctioned, implemented, but we implemented in phases. There was the pilot testing, first phase here, installation of two for kilo, 350,000 barrels a day of water, increased the capacity up to 5,000, later up, up to 800,000 barrels a day of water went into the field as we learned and developed the, the field as we went through. Now, what you also saw immediately was a sharp drop in the, in the gas production, and you can also see the increase in oil production that happened afterwards. And that response is a very classical and maybe more the more healthy war injection responses you, can, you have ever seen. Now, if you didn't do it, we might have gone this route. And here's where you can say that the Equifisk has increased its recovery factor by almost three times since its, since its uh, discovery. What's in the backbone of that is war injection. And what is it that we can do because of the extra pressure that the war gives you? It has been a significant and tremendous success story over the years. Basically, what we see on, on a, on a um, microscopic scale is a fantastic sweep efficiency, seeing about 30% residual oil behind it everywhere in all formations. And what this taught me, be skeptical to lab data, challenge it, 
because the truth shows you something different. What happened when we put the water in the chalk? It became weak. And when we started to inject the water, our expectation was that subsidence was going to go down. We had subsided about 40 centimeters a year, and we would expect it to see it go down as we started to inject the water. It did not. What we could see is that we started to see increased compaction. This is a monitoring well where we're monitoring subsidence over time periods. We started to see water coming in because we also logged the saturations in this observation well. We will see the water comes in, we also see the compaction. We see the water coming in, we see the compaction, as until the pressure is increased enough. So, we needed to be patient. And basically what we could see was that, okay, we started to inject water, the 40 centimeters a day became 10, 5, and now 3 centimeters a year of subsidence. And we now have more or less of a constant reservoir pressure maintaining pressure with the work we're putting in, and now have control of subsidence. Now, what we also have, we might have a lot of stored compaction potential in this, because we have injected now a lot of water into it. So, to get to this point, a lot of research, initiated by the NPD and the Danish, because of the common problems we had both in the Danish sector and on the Norwegian sector. A lot of funds, a lot of efforts had gone into this. And the main things that has been studied and has been shared between the Danish and the Norwegian sector has been around well constructions, well stimulations, well completions, rock mechanics, understanding the subsidence compaction issues, and also the EOR portion of it. That has been the main uh, elements of the, the research that has gone on for since the early 1980s until just recently. So where do we sit? We said we were going to have like 17% on Ecofisk to start with. We have produced now about 44% of the initial oil. We have plans to take it up to 52. And obviously the question to us as restaurant engineers and as companies and license is to what do you intend to do with the remainder? Now, I also putting up the NPD chart. We have the Ecofisk over here, what we have produced, what we plan to produce and what's remaining. And we've got Sverdro sitting just next to it here. That kind of puts Ecofisk a little bit in perspectives in terms of, of size. Now, given that a lot of this green that says there remains in the, is below some sort of a cutoff volume, there is at least volumes here to still continue to chase. And our plans are to do that with infill drilling. We need to kind of get the water in every corner of the field. And then the big question mark, can we do something about the residual or saturation that are left behind the, the waterfront? So, to do that, we have installed, like we mentioned here early on, we installed a, a permanent seismic system in place in 2010. We now have 8, 17 surveys out of that actively being used. We see the fiber optics here, 98% of the sensor are still active. Fantastic system. We use it every day, both for mapping what's happening in the overburden, but also trying to map out waterfronts and find the bypassed oil and locate where we're going to do the infiltrating. And if I was going to ask something in here, it is, I think we've come a far distance in understanding the use of these 4D data. But still, we have a tremendous amount to learn. And if there is companies in here that have anything that would like to give us here and provide good ideas to us, our arms are open to help us <laughs> in, in, this, in this area. So I would just maybe just stop with this one. If you're going to look at the OR, what we have, what we have focused on is to do something with attacking the residual oil saturation, either do that through the simple stuff surfactants or to do it with something with the water compositions. And we have also been looking at fish war, which is CO2 put into the water. So can we do something there? But CO2 and chalk, they are not friends. That we, we can say that. So that is a part of the studies that we have on be ongoing. And that you can also see on the number of EOR studies we've done over the years has been rather extensive and comprehensive, but we cannot give up we need to still continue to attack that last, the last portion of that residual oil. So, with that, and I started to feel I was talking pretty fast at the end, <laughs> to get to this point. <clears throat> so this was five, 50 years and 45 minutes. Thanks very much. Or 40, or 48 uh, minutes. It's uh, very interesting. I'm just very curious about uh, how did it happen that Oftenposten 
actually became aware of this discovery just a few days after it happened. Yeah. Who, who, who was not tight? I don't know. A Norwegian? An American? I don't know. No idea. It's, got, it's really interesting. I, I didn't know that, actually, because... And I, and I don't think it was a control leak. <laughs> All right. All right. Th thanks very much, Eduard. Okay. It Thank was, uh, as I said, very interesting. And... Uh, um, We will have a break uh, for lunch. I will be back here in one hour. We start at one sharp. <laughs>